Technical uh, University, uh, who will uh, give us a talk on morphisms generating anti-palindromic words. Okay, so thank you for this opportunity to present our work. And I will be speaking about morphisms generating uh, anti-palindromic words. So I will be speaking about anti-palindromes and I will also be speaking about uh, palindromes. So just a short reminder, well, uh, everyone in here knows that the palindrome is a word which is the same when read back backwards, but uh, what do we use more is that it is a word which is invariant under mirror image antimorphism R. So uh, for example, well, every language has uh, their own palindromes. In Czech, we've got, for example, krk, which is neck, or tahat, which means pull. And uh, using the same idea or similar idea, an antipolindrome is a finite binary word invariant under exchange map antimorphism. So uh, a palindrome is defined or can be defined on, on alphabet of any size uh, concerning the antipalindromes in here. Uh, they are defined only on a binary alphabet. And from this moment on, I will be only speaking about binary alphabets. So for example, on alphabet AB, the exchange antimorphism E is the map which sends A to B and B to A. And it is antimorphism, so the concatenation of letters, uh, concatenation of, uh, well, image of concatenation is concatenation of images in uh, the opposite direction. So again, an example from Czech language, we've got, for example, about on alphabet N and I, we've got uh, antipalindrome ni ni which means something belonging to Nina, which is a name. And it's not only antipalindrome, it's also cube. And OK, now uh, what we are interested in are antipalindromic words. So let me start with palindromic words. An infinite word is palindromic if it contains arbitrarily long palindromes, or alternatively, you can say if, if it contains infinitely many palindromes. So a lot of known words are palindromic. For example, the Fibonacci word, which is the fixed point of, of uh, morphism zero is sent, sent, uh, sent it to zero one, and one goes to zero. So here you see a prefix <clears throat> of this infinite Fibonacci word. and you can see palindrome zero zero, palindrome zero one zero, one zero zero one, and so on and so on and so on. In fact, we know exact number of, of palindromes uh, for any given length in Fibonacci work. Another example, and I will need this morphism later, is a tumor's word, the fixed point of a tumor's morphism, which sends zero to zero one and one to one zero. So again, here you see a prefix of, uh, of this uh, infinite word fixed by this morphism theta. And uh, here is, for example, palindrome 101, palindrome 011, and so on and so on. This tumorous word not only contains infinite number of palindromes, it also contains an infinite number of antipalindromes. For example, here is a palindrome zero one, uh, sorry, antipalindrome zero one. It is really antipalindrome because if you, <clears throat> uh, if you apply this exchange map E onto word zero one, you will get uh, E of one concatenated with, the, concatenated with E of zero, which is zero one. Another antipalindrome here, for example, zero zero one one, one one zero one zero zero and so on and so on. So using the same logic, an infinite word is called antipalindromic if it contains infinitely many antipalindromes. <clears throat> so which known words are palindromic? Well, actually a lot of them. All Sturmian words are palindromic. Arno Rossi words or Larger class containing Arnorosi words, Epistermian words are antipalindromic, uh, palindromic, sorry. Uh, codings of symmetric K interval exchange transformations are palindromic uh, concerning antipalindromicity. Uh, as I said before, 
the tumors work is antipalindromic. And also, for example, complementary symmetric rod sequences are antipalindromic. Well, these are sequences, well, complementary symmetric rod sequence is uh, such an infinite sequence V, so that its map under this mapping S is a Sturmian. And what does it, what does this S map do? Well, it takes an infinite word V0, V1, V2, and so on. And it creates an infinite word U0, U1, U2 using the formula that UI is VI plus VI plus one modulo two. So for example, if I take a Fibonacci word F to be an image of a word under this uh, mapping S, and I, I would like to find this V, this pre-image under S. So obviously uh, I have to start somehow, and I've got two possibilities. I can choose the starting letter, either zero or one, and this choice will give me two possible words V. So I will start, for example, with zero. And now uh, second letter of what V has to be such that zero plus the second letter modulo two will give me zero. So obviously zero and the third letter uh, will be such that uh, second zero plus this third letter modulo two is one. So it is one and so on and so on and so on. So in this way I can, I can continue. And the good thing or the, the reason why this uh, is helpful when finding antipalindromic words is the following one. Uh, it's quite simple observation that if I've got two infinite words, U and V, size that U is image of V under this S mapping, then if U contains infinitely many palindromes with uh, center one, so palindromes of odd length such that the middle, middle letter is one, then V contains infinitely many antipalindromes. And if U contains infinitely many palindromes with either center zero or uh, with an empty word as a center, so it means that they are palindrome of even length, then V contains infinitely many palindromes. Uh, now I've got one small unrelated remark, which, well, it is unrelated. So uh, this mapping S uh, can be also applied to different words. And for example, if you apply it to tumorous words T, so the, the fixed point of, of tumorous morphism, the image is a period doubling sequence. The fixed point of morphism zero goes to one, one, and one goes to one, zero. And uh, Anna Fried, about, about a month ago, when she was speaking here at the seminary, uh, she was speaking about uh, prefix palindromic length of, of words, and she gave a precise formula for uh, prefix palindromic length of a humorous word. And at the same time, she, she conjectured or gave a conjecture concerning the prefix palindromic length of a period doubling word. So maybe this connection via the mapping S may be of some help concerning her, her conjecture. But as I said, this is completely unrelated to our topic uh, here. So I will start with, with palindromic words. And then I will, I will continue to antipalindromic words to, to, uh, to our results. So the, the motivation for, for the study of uh, palindromic words comes from the work of Hoff, Neil, and Simon uh, when they studied the spectral properties of uh, such uh, discrete Schrodinger operator where this, this potential V here in the operator is uh, mapping from Z to R, taking only fin finite number of values. And as soon as you see something like that, you, you will think of an infinite word. Because that is exactly that, mapping from Z to R, having only finite number of values. And this is actually the, the thing which they used in their paper when they studied properties of, of, this, uh, of this operator, uh, 
Well, I do not understand the physical stuff. So, but uh, a big picture is that the, the operator or the, the thing which it models has some interesting properties if and only if it has a purely singular continuum spectrum. And uh, they were able to derive or show that it has, uh, the, the, this operator has a purely singular continuum spectrum if and only if this infinite work V, which, which is a model of the potential in the operator, is aperiodic and palindromic. So palindromic meaning it contains infinite number of palindromes. And they defined a whole class P of morphisms that generate palindromic words. So how does this class look like? Well, class P is a class of primitive morphisms. So well, morphism phi is in class P if there exists a palindrome W such that the image of every letter in our alphabet A, in the alphabet A, is a concatenation of this common palindrome W with a palindrome QA. And this QA can be different from different, four different letters. So uh, for example, our uh, known uh, Fibonacci morphism is in class P. The, uh, the common palindrome W here is, is played by the letter A. And then the palindrome for the letter A, so palindrome QA is just a letter B and palindrome for the letter B. So it means that the, the QB from, from the definition is empty word. Uh, our second example, uh, tumor's word or tumor's, mor tumor's morphism is not in class B because uh, there is no, no common prefix of the images of A and B. So it means that if this morphism was in class B, the W should, would be empty word, but then neither A, B, nor B, A are palindromes. So it doesn't, the, it doesn't uh, work with the definition. But if you look at the square of the tumor morphism, at the second iteration, it is actually in class B because the image of A is ABBA, -B -A, an image of B is BAAB. -B. So the, uh, the common palindrome, uh, the common palindromic prefix of images of letters is actually the empty word uh, epsilon. And then the palindrome QA for letter A is ABBA -B and the palindrome QB for letter B is BAAB. -A -B. Uh, it's quite easy to see that if, uh, if I've got the morphism from this class P, then its fixed point will contain an infinite number of palindromes. So the other direction is interesting. And uh, already Hoff uh, at his, and his co-authors uh, had a small remark in their paper that exactly they said that we do not know whether all palindromic words generated by primitive morphisms arise from morphisms in class B. It's a little bit vaguely formulated and uh, we will see some, some uh, formal formulation of this, of this conjecture. So first who studied this uh, conjecture, we can call it either a class P conjecture or HKS conjecture, because of the, of the other authors were uh, Alush, Bake, Kassen, and Demenik. They proved two things. The first of all, they proved that this uh, common uh, palindrome W in the definition, well, we cannot restrict ourselves to the cases where W is empty or it is uh, a single letter. And also they were able to prove that the conjecture holds for periodic sequences, for periodic words. So as soon as a periodic sequence is palindromic, it is a fixed point of a morphism in class B. The second result or second set of results actually uh, are due to Ten or Tan, uh, who was interested in, in the binary case and well, first of all, he realized that the, the property to be palindromic is not a property of the word itself. It's, it's a property of the language of the word. And 
he was able to show that if a fixed point of a primitive binary morphism is palindromic, uh, then either the morphism itself or its square, its second iteration, has a conjugate in class P. Not it is in class P, but has a conjugate in class P. So again, let me remind you what the conjugate is. So let's say we've got two morphisms, phi and psi, and we say that the phi is conjugate to psi if there is a word Q such that either for all the letters phi i q is q psi i, or again for all the letters q phi i is, uh, oh, sorry, phi a is uh, psi a q. So, as an example, I can take, for example, morphism phi, which sends a to b, a, b, b, a, b and B to B, A, 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 B. Uh, first observation about this morphism is that this morphism does not belong to class P because the, the longest palindromic, the, the long, longest common palindromic prefix of, of the images of letters is B, but then neither A, B, B, A, B, nor A, 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 B is a palindrome. So again, it does not, um, uh, follow the definition. So this morphism is not in class B. But uh, if you consider a conjugate to this morphism uh, created by taking the suff common suffix AB and putting it in, in front, so uh, our new morphism Psi will look like this. You just take AB from the end of uh, image of A and put it in front, and they, then you take AB from the end of image of B and put it in front, then this new morphism, or uh, new, this, this conjugation of our uh, original morphism already is in class B. The, the common palindrome W from the definition is uh, ABBAB, uh, sorry, ABBA, and then palindrome for letter A is BB, and palindrome for letter B is A. So this is in class B. And the reason why this is so important is uh, because of the following quite known result that if we've got a primitive morphism, it's a fixed point and another morphism, which is conjugate to phi and it's fixed point, then the languages of uh, fixed points are, are the same. Uh, so uh, I'll, uh, allow me interrupt you that because phi the morphism phi is in class p just phi confused is... yeah because these images are palindromes image of a is palindrome ah, of p. so oh. you didn't choose okay wrong example <laughs> ah how did i manage to do that i don't know i'm sorry so uh, the there exists example the is, <laughs> at, least, at least the idea is is uh, the right one. I think, uh, you can have a morphism which is not in class P, find its conjugate which is in class P. And uh, okay, what now? Um, yep. So the first version, or uh, let's say uh, formal formulation of, of a conju conjecture by Hoff, Neil, and Simon uh, is the following one. Let you be. Uh, a fixed point of a primitive morphism, then it is palindromic if and only if there exists morphism which fixes this U and it has a conjugate in class P. So we've already seen that this version of a conjecture was uh, is true for periodic words. Uh, by result of Alush and his co-authors. It is also true for, for on, on any binary alphabet by result of Tan. A later a proof was given by Sebastian Laba and Edita Palantova for fixed point of, of marked morphisms by, on arbitrary alphabet. I will not define this class of morphism, but let's say it's a special class of morphisms. And also there is a result by Zuzana Masakova Edita Palantava and Stepan Starosta that uh, words coding symmetric non degenerate three interval exchange transformations also for, for this word, the, the conjecture also holds. 
Unfortunately, uh, Sebastian Labe also found a counter example on, on ternary alphabet because he was able to prove that if you consider a morphism which sends A to ACA, B to CAB and C to B, then the fixed point of this morphism is palindromic, but no morphism which fixes this fixed point has a conjugating class B. So uh, having this in mind, uh, another version of the conjecture was formulated, namely the following one. So if we've got a fixed point of a primitive morphism phi, then if it is palindromic, then there exists uh, another morphism in class B such that the languages of both morphisms coincide. And this version of conjecture is, uh, well, it is still conjecture. No one was able to prove it. And what was our aim? Well, we, will, we were trying to do something similar in case of antipalindromic words. So to study a modification of this class P conjecture for antipalindromes, to, to find a class of morphisms uh, which, well, first of all, they do generate antipalindromic fixed points. And at the same time, any uh, antipalindromic fixed point is a, well, either fixed point of morphism in this class or has a conjugate or something like that. So uh, in the end, we were, we, we defined two classes, A1, A2, and uh, this is summary of our results. And I will uh, come back to this image at the end of my talk. So our first class, class A1, is uh, the following class. Uh, a morphism is said to belong to class A1 if there exist two words, P and S, uh, such that P is non-empty and S is an antipalindrome, such that uh, image of zero is P concatenated with S and image of one under this morphism phi is E image of P concatenated with S. Just, just a small reminder, we only deal with binary alphabets and uh, I will only consider alphabet zero. So as an example, the following morphism does belong to our class A1. Uh, in this, the zero is sent to 1101 and one is sent to 0001. In this case, P is 11, antipalindrome S is 01, and uh, E of P is 00. Uh, I've got several remarks about this, this class or about morphisms in this class. First of all, all morphisms in this class are uniform. It means that uh, the, the lengths of images of all, both letters, zero and one, are the same. Uh, also, all morphisms in this class are primitive, uh, with the only exception of a trivial case where uh, phi of zero is um, zero to the power of k, and phi of one is one to k. And the last uh, remark is that, uh, to some extent, this class has already been considered by Sebastian Labe when he was well, basically trying to do the same, to, to find morphisms fixing uh, antipalindromic words. Uh, so what we were able to prove in this case? Well, first of all, that if uh, phi is a primitive morphism from this class A1 and U is fixed point, then the language of this fixed point contains infinitely many antipalindromes. Uh, this, um, okay. uh, this can be quite easily uh, proved using the following lemma, uh, which states that if I've got a morphism in this class A1, then E of S concatenated with uh, phi of W is equal to S concatenated with phi of E of W for any finite binary watch W. 
So to, this lemma, well, one can easily prove it by induction. Uh, if you take uh, by induction on the length of the word W. So if you start with a length one, so if you take V to be just one letter zero, then, uh, okay, E of S phi of zero. So what is phi of zero? Well, by the definition of the class A1, this is equal to PS. So I've got E image of SPS. Now, since S is an antipalindrome, then E of S is equal to S. So I've got S EPS. And again, by definition of our class, EPS, E of PS is just an image of one under our morphism phi. And finally, one is just image of zero under E. So I have what I wanted to have. Well, left hand side and right hand side are exactly what the lemma says should be. For one, one can prove it analogically. And uh, for longer, longer words, you just continue by induction. And having this lemma, we are able to prove the following. And I will, I will just skip, skip the proof. I, I will just give you, give you the ideas. Well, first, uh, first ingredient is that if W is in palindrome, then S uh, concatenated with phi image of W is also palindrome. Uh, then uh, second ingredient is that for if uh, if W is in the language of U, then S phi of W is also in the language of U. And using the, these two things that uh, I've got antipalindrome and by applying this operation, I also have a palindrome which stays in the language we are able to produce longer and longer palindromes. We only need a, some starting point, and starting point in this case would be uh, antipalindrome uh, antipalindrome one zero or zero one. Uh, at least one of them is in the in the language. Now, uh, then there is another class. A class A2, and I will explain later how we came, how we found this class. So the class A2 is the following one. A morphism psi, again, binary morphism uh, on zero one, uh, belongs to class A2 if there exists non-empty word W and two integers K and H such that uh, psi of zero is equal to theta image, where, where theta is our humor morphism of W concatenated with K power of RWW, where R is uh, this uh, mirror image antimorphism. And psi of one is again, theta image of RWW to the power of H concatenated with that RW. So the, the definition definitely <laughs> does not look nice, but uh, uh, for example, if you, uh, if you take K equal to H equal to zero, and if you take W to be just a word of length one or a better set, a letter zero, then uh, more, this morphism psi in our class A coincide with, with humorous, uh, humorous morphism. So for example, humorous morphism is, is in, this, in this class A2. Uh, morphisms in this class in general are non-uniform. So this is the first difference from, from the class A1 because uh, K, K and H can be, uh, can be of different length or uh, can be different numbers. Uh, and uh, similarly to class A1, all morphisms in this class are primitive. Uh, concerning this class, again, we were able to derive a similar result to, to the class A1, namely the following one, that 
if I've got a morphism in this class A2 and I've got a fixed point of this morphism, then its language contains infinitely many empty polynomials. Uh, so the, the result is basically the same, only the, the proof is uh, a little bit longer and uh, more technical. Uh, so uh, at this moment, we've got two classes, class A1 and class A2 of morphisms having uh, antipalindromic fixed point. And the question is, what about the other way around? Can, can, can we change the direction of the implication? Well, uh, in some cases, yes. In some cases, we do not know. So uh, from now on, I, U will stand for a fixed point of a primitive morphism and uh, anti-palindromic word. So our conjecture, and so far it's only conjecture, is that if there is a primitive morphism, uh, so if, if, if U is, is such a word, that it is a fixed point of a primitive morphism and antipalindromic, then there is a morphism psi in a union of classes A1 and A2, such that the languages of our word U and a fixed point of this uh, morphism psi coincide. So basically we conjecture that uh, you can, that the opposite direction of implications in our uh, previous theorems are true. Uh, First supporting fact or first, uh, first case where uh, this is true uh, is uh, in case of, uh, of eventually periodic words. It uh, easily follows from a result of Sebastian Labe. Well, first of all, if I've got uh, eventually periodic word, which is a fixed point of primitive morphism, this necessarily periodic and it follows uh, from a result of Sebastian Labe that the period of uh, such a word is just concatenation of two antipalindromes, W1, W2. And then one can easily see that such a point is fixed by morphism psi of zero is equal to psi of one is equal to W1, W2. And uh, this uh, morphism uh, does belong to our class A1. So for periodic words, uh, the, the conjecture is true. So it is a similar to, uh, to, peri uh, to palindromic case where the, the first result uh, by Alush and his co-authors also was that the conjecture is true for, for periodic words. Now, we were also able to prove the conjecture for uniform morphisms in general. So our result is the following one. If, uh, if uh, U is an aperiodic fixed point of a primitive binary uniform morphism phi, such that the language of this fixed point contains infinitely many antipalindromes, then either, psi, or either phi or phi square is conjugated to a morphism in class A1. So uh, for uniform morphisms, Everything is nice. The, the, the situation is the following one. We've got a set of languages of, uh, of words fixed by uh, morphisms in class P. We've got a set of languages of morphisms, uh, fig, uh, of, of a set of languages of words fixed by morphisms in our class A1, which is equal to uh, class A. Uh, where A is the, is the class of morphisms fixing all antipalindromic words. Uh, in this case, uniform morphisms. Unfortunately, uh, the situation is not that easy uh, when you get rid of the assumption of uniformity. Uh, first, we hope that it wouldn't be that, that difficult, but uh, we were not able to prove the, the general theorem. And uh, we were only given a partial result uh, by uh, doing this, that we, we throw away the assumption of uniformity, uh, but 
we had to add an assumption of, of palindromicity. And you will see it on the next slide. Uh, only a small remark about this, uh, this intersection here of, of our two sets or LP and LA1. So if, you, if you've got morphism in class A1 uh, and it's uh, a periodic fixed point, then uh, this uh, fixed point is anti so, sorry, it's palindromic if and only if uh, the S uh, word in our definition is empty and the P word in our definition is palindromic. So the, there is a non-empty intersection of these two sets. Now, concerning the non-uniform morphisms, as I said before, uh, we were only able to, to obtain a partial result, namely the following one. Let U be an aperiodic fixed point of a primitive binary non-uniform morphism phi, such that its language contains infinite number of palindromes as well as antipalindromes. Then again, the either phi or phi square is a morphism in, in class A2. So the situation is the following one. I've already shown you the, the image before. We've got our three classes, P, A1, A2, P, A1, A2, with uh, non-empty intersections. And uh, if A stands for class of morphisms fixing antipalindromic words, then this non-filled region here, well, our conjecture is that this non-filled region is empty, but we were not able to prove it so far. So I've got uh, about three, three comments. Well, first, again, I said, bit, I, I've already said it before, but uh, let me state it again. Uh, this problem or the similar pro problem for palindromic words has already been, is completely solved by, by Alu Shato and, and, and Tan. Uh, similar problem has been studied by Sebastian Labay. I, I think it was in his master thesis, I think. Uh, he was interested in, in uniform morphisms having antipalindromic fixed point. And uh, his approach was to use a direct analog of, of class P of morphisms. So he considered class which he denotes EP. And the morphism is in EP if uh, for all, both letters, 0 and 1, uh, the, the image of, of, a, of this letter under phi is P concatenated with PA, where P, P0, and P1 are antipalindromes. And he was able to prove that uh, if a morphism has an antipalindromic fixed point, then either the morphism itself or uh, the, uh, uh, phi and uh, tau, uh, humorous morphism, uh, is a conjugated to morphism in class EP. Uh, so he was able to prove this and he conjectured that uh, only the, uh, the latter case is true all the times. And uh, by one of our results, we proved his conjecture. And uh, last comment is, uh, okay, as I said before, we were hoping that uh, uh, that the situation or uh, the problem uh, wouldn't be that difficult, or at least uh, at most as difficult as uh, the palindromic case. Because, for example, uh, unlike palindromic case, uh, because of how, how the exchange map E works, how antipalindromes are defined, necessarily, if if an infinite word is antipalindrome, uh, the frequency of both letters is equal to one half, which uh, definitely is not true in palindromic case. And this fact has 
quite important cons consequences for for matrix of substitutions fixing such words. So uh, our initial intuition was, well, it wouldn't be that. It, it shouldn't be that that difficult. Well, it turned out it is. Uh, finally, uh, I've got just uh, two or three related problems. Uh, first of all, uh, palindromic pseudo palindromic closure. Again, a, a lot of people here know that uh, palindromic and as well anti palindromic words can be constructed, uh, the so called palindromic or pseudo palindromic closure was uh, first inspected by, by De Luca and De Luca, where, for example, they showed up. I, I will not, not give you the, the general construction, but most of you does know. Most of you do know this construction. I will just uh, show it in the case of humorous word. Uh, De Luca and De Luca <clears throat> gave uh, construction, this construction for, for humorous word. And they, they show that there is a, a sequence uh, of uh, pairs of uh, letters and morphisms, where the letters are taken from 0, 1, and morphisms are uh, taken from R and E, it's a mirror image and exchange map. And if you uh, generate words by taking U I plus one being the shortest uh, Psi I palindrome or well, so it's either R palindrome, which is palindrome, or E palindrome, which is antipalindrome, with a prefix U I D I. And if you if you iterate this this construction, uh, you are getting longer and longer prefixes of of humorous word. Uh, similarly, also complementary symmetric road words can be generated by pseudo palindromic closure. It was shown by uh, Blondin Masse and his, uh, his co-authors. And uh, uh, Lubka Dvořáková and her student uh, Teresa Velka. Uh, we're inspecting uh, or the, the following problem, and the problem which words generated by pseudo palindromic closure are fixed point of morphisms. And uh, their conjecture is that the only morphism which would generate such fixed points are of the following form, where uh, uh, phi of zero is zero, one, one, zero to the power of K, and phi of one is one, 0, 0, 001 to the power of k. So please know, know that these morphisms belong to the intersection of, uh, of class P and our class A1. So one of uh, possible future research is to inspect <clears throat> whether other morphisms in our classes A1 or A2 have, have fixed points arising by, by pseudo palindromic closures. Uh, Another somehow related uh, thing is the richness. As, uh, not all palindromic infinite words are rich in palindromes. Uh, rich in palindromes in this, well, the word is rich, infinite word is rich in palindromes if all its uh, factors uh, contain the maximal number of palindromes and the maximal number of palindromes for a word of length n is n plus one. And uh, the, the question, even for class P is, is not completely solved. So it is not known which morphisms in class P do have rich fixed points and which do not. Some partial results were derived by, by Amy Glenn and uh, her co-authors. So again, it may be of some interest to uh, inspect which morphisms in classes A1 uh, intersection with P and A2 intersection with P are such that their fixed, point, fixed points are H rich, uh, where, where H is the, the group of morphisms and antimorphisms generated by E and R. And uh, finally, uh, one can always try to generalize these concepts to uh, alphabets with more letters. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the definitions uh, have to be a little bit different because as soon 
as you have at least three letters in your alphabet, there are more involuntary antimorphisms, not only R and E. So uh, you have to consider a group generated by antimorphisms over, over monoid A star. And then you can ask uh, when, what, what are the conditions on the, on the morphism, uh, on, the, on the world, so that it contains infinitely many F palindromes for, for a given F in this group G. Where, as usual, F palindrome is a, is a finite word, which is fixed by this, by this antipalindrome F, uh, sorry, by this antimorphism F. And that's it. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Peter. Um, does anyone have any questions for Peter? Yes, I have one, Peter. Thanks for your talk. So in the previous the question, you had one word. Sorry? Uh, in? But, yeah, the question is, uh, the, you have the picture. Can you, I don't know if you can. The one with the complement of A1 and A2. This one? Yes, yes, yes. So you say that you conjecture that the below white thing is empty. So yes. Can you say some words like, why is this difficult to prove? Where's the... Well, <laughs> at least because even even for, uh, even for even with the edit, uh, edit assumption with palindromicity, the, the result is uh, quite technical. Mm. And uh, ah, I don't know because um, somehow, well, recently it uh, occurred to us that maybe this this mapping S, which is used in the definition of complementary symmetric uh, root words, uh, may be of some help in this uh, in this direction, but. Uh, so far, we had no time to, to inspect this. So, so maybe not all hope is lost, but okay. right Thank now, you. that's probably all I can say. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? All right. 